membership class for Crestline First Baptist Church. <laughs> That's right. This is our membership class. What's a membership class? Well, we are members of the body of Christ. Membership is not about having your name on a piece of paper, really. Membership is about the fact that we join with Jesus Christ and become one with him. So membership is much more spiritual than we think of it. Sometimes we think it's just, okay, well, I'm going to have my name on a list or something like that. And, and some of us don't want our name on a list, so we don't become members. <laughs> but you see, membership is about relationship. Our church uh, took, a, took a vision statement a few years ago, and the vision of Crestline First Baptist Church almost said friendship community. That's gone back a ways. <laughs> <laughs> It's like 15 years, 20? <laughs> Anyways, that the, the, the vision of Crestline First Baptist Church is to be a relational church that is sold out for Jesus Christ. We're going to try to unpack that more as we also unpack our mission statement. And the mission statement is putting legs to, to faith putting legs to faith. And that's a creative way of us looking at four things of what our mission is. Number one, it's about loving God. Number two, it's about encouraging one another to grow. Number three, it's about um, growing as Christ's disciples. And number four, it's about sharing Jesus. So for the next four weeks, we'll take each one of those little phrases and look at each one of them, try to say, what does that mean for us individually? What does that mean for us corporately? At the end of the month, actually, first Sunday in February, we'll be inviting you to covenant. What's a covenant? Well, that's a commitment made, a spiritual commitment made between God and his people. You might remember Abraham had a covenant and it was the first uh, an original covenant and then from there Moses has his covenant and we, and we have several along the way, the journey and there's these relational commitments between God and his people. And, but the key word there is relational commitments. You see, people talk all the time that, um, well, I don't want to be involved in religion and you know what? Neither do I. In fact, frankly, we're not here for religion, are we? But what we are here for is to have a relationship with God and to help one another grow in that relationship with God. And so when we talk about being a relational church, we're talking about all of us helping each other grow closer to Christ, becoming more like him, building that relationship. And the fact is, folks, and I'm, I, maybe this needs to be tough for us. And I'm going to warn you that the text is going to be tough on us. Because the text is going to say to us this morning that if we're not loving one another, then we don't love God. And, and John is like really strong with this point. If we don't love one another. In fact, folks, John's not even trying to push the point of loving our enemies. That's even tougher, isn't it? Well, maybe not. Maybe it's easier to love our enemies than it is to love the brother and sister sitting next to you. Oh, sometimes we can do very loving things out there with a stranger. But what do we do with the person we know? Here's one of the things I've also found, and let's be straightforward about this one too. Most of you don't know each other. No, come on, really. Most of you don't know each other. And I'm talking about even those of you who have been a part of Crestline First Baptist Church for a lot longer than I have been. And sometimes the, the, the most, what do you say, consistent saints in the church. Do you really know each other? Or let me ask you a different way. Do the people in this room know you? Do you know, do the people in this room know what breaks your heart? Do the people in this room know what gets you excited? Some of you are saying, Bill, you're excited about everything. Chill, dude. No. <laughs> Do the people here know you? It's interesting. If you look at scripture, what is one of the key words that the Old Testament uses for a relational love? The word is no. No. K-N-O-W. And so at the beginning of time, when man was created, what does it say? And Adam knew his wife. And they became one. As we look at the Trinity, are you, are you aware that the Trinity is a community? 
God Father, God Son, God Holy Spirit. How are they one? They are. Because they say they are. So they are. I believe it. They are one. And yet, they have these parts to them, don't they? And here's the interesting thing is when also in Genesis 1, when it talks about creation, it talks about and they. What? Yeah, you go find the, see if you search for the verse right there in chapter 1, where it talks about they creating. They bringing things into existence. Do you see the presence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in creation? Genesis, excuse me, John 1 helps us see it. What does John 1 say? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth, yes? What was present in creation? God the Word, the living Word. Because how did God create? Well, Genesis says that God spoke. His living word brought things into existence. So God the Father designs things. God the Son, his word is what gives life. And then what does the spirit do? Did you notice the spirit is hovering over the waters? And when God gives life to humanity, what does it say? He forms him from the dirt. And he shapes him and he creates him. And then what does he do? And he breathes into him. He ruachs into him. No, that's not a nasty word. That's the word for spirit. Wind, breath. The spirit of God gives humanity life. And it's the same thing still today. So as we go through this series, and even as we begin here today, we want to understand that we're on a mission. And that mission begins with loving God, who is in community. You see, relationship is what God's all about. The Trinity is about relationship. God creates us so that we can have relationship with him and relationship with one another. So we want to be a relational church that is sold out for Jesus Christ. And if you're not real relational, okay, we, you know, we give you space, I hope. I mean, look, we got you wider chairs so you didn't have to sit right next to the person, you know, by you. <laughs> um, we allow you to move around in the room. We, we try to give you space. But the fact is, folks, that if you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to have to learn how to love the other people in this room. Some of you are easier to love than others. Some of us are harder to love. I know, right? Some of us make it difficult for people to love us. We're busy. We're rushing around. We're doing other kinds of things. We have that edge on us. And, you know, I can't get close to him or her or whatever. And yet God is challenging us. If you're really going to understand his love for you, you're going to have to love other people. Incidentally, we had the privilege of doing some of that this week. Any of you seen any of the, the news clips or the, the, the newspaper article? Or Here's a picture. Uh, some of us had the privilege. Wade's not here this morning, but Alexander. Uh, <laughs> Alexander was down here with Wade and me as uh, we got to greet um, the first 27 people who were brought up from um, 138. 78 cars, 136 people were stranded on 138. Some of them from Crestline, a lot of them not from Crestline, uh, without chains. Some of them had chains. Some of them had, there were Jeeps down there with four-wheel drive, and they, they got stuck too. Well, we had a fire engine in the way too. That didn't help things. <laughs> so there was a lot going on there, but 78 cars, 136 people, four excuse me, three snow cats. That's what you see kind of there in the picture. These are, you know, those belt drive, um, like, a, like a caterpillar. And uh, they, they went up and down the mountain, 27 in the first trip. Eventually, we had about 50 people here. In fact, a few people kept showing up about 6 a.m. even. The Red Cross finally made it at 5 a.m. <laughs> with, with, a, with the last snow cat that had to go down the front side of the mountain to get them because they were stuck down and couldn't get, couldn't get up with their truck, even though it was four-wheel drive. 
So it was a rather challenging night. And um, I want to thank all those who helped on the Tuesday night and then on, th- on Wednesday morning uh, who, and Wednesday day, <laughs> Joan and Doug, who came over here and had fun cleaning up. <laughs> um, we had the privilege of loving the community. We became an emergency shelter. It wasn't our plan. Uh, I know when, uh, when I got the phone call at 10.30, it wasn't my plan to spend the, the night awake. <laughs> And yet we had the privilege of loving the community. And that's what God wants for us. No, by the way, it didn't cost us anything. People donated $250 back to the church. (laughs) Even when you're telling, no, please don't. No, we're just doing this. We still had the privilege of, of blessing people. Had a couple of divine appointments and, and um, gentlemen that got to spend a good bit of time with, both driving him to his home and back again and all. And God gives us opportunities to love other people. Divine appointments. Because God has called us to be a relational church that is sold out for Jesus. And that might cost you something. Now, one night's sleep, is that really that big a deal? No, it's not what it costs Jesus cost him hanging on a cross out of love. Well, let's look at uh, 1 John. And Daryl read a piece of it, and we're going to look at it some more. 1 John says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. I need to reread that verse. I want you to be willing as we go through this text these next four weeks, and today is critical, I want you to be willing to hold a mirror up as you read the scripture. The mirror is for you to look at yourself. Verse 9 again. This is how God showed, excuse me, verse 8. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. That's pretty cool, isn't it? If you acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Son of God, he actually lives in you and you in God. Whoa! This is more miraculous than I think we totally comprehend. We, we should almost be breathless with excitement when we really grab a hold of that sometimes. And, it's, and it, the sad thing is, is it's so familiar to us that, that we almost miss the depth of what I just read to you. If you acknowledge Jesus, the Son of God, he's living in you and you are alive in him. Somebody say preach it, okay? Somebody say, say something. Thank you. I lost my place. What verse am I on? Help me. (laughs) 12? Thank you. 16? Thank you. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Because in this world, we are like him. 
There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. As we attempt to put legs to faith, we're really building this out of another verse as well, where Jesus, if you might remember, was talking with a teacher of the law. And the teacher of the law comes, and this is going to be the last test that Jesus experienced. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're all going to finally give up and say, okay, fine. And this man asks him a very important question. In Matthew 22, he says, one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? In other words, teacher, okay, you know, there's all, all these laws out there, and he's thinking about a whole ton. Although Moses had how many? Ten. Ten instructions for successful living. Ten keys to joy and happiness. Ten ways to really have a great relationship with God. He says, so what's the most important one? And here's how Jesus responds. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. But I think Jesus then continues without taking a breath. Of the Lord or your God with all your heart, your mind, soul, strength. And the second, because he wants to make sure that it's understood, that the greatest commandment involves two things. Love the Lord your God with everything you've got. And, not, and secondly, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. If we're going to put legs to our faith, we need to love God. But loving God means loving one another. That's why last year we changed the name of our agape meal to agape meal. We used to call it laughs, lunch after first Sunday. It was a kind of a cute thing that we used to use. Kind of neat. You know, we're going to laugh after church on Sunday, first Sunday of the month. And we went out to restaurants and did different things like that. But an agape meal says something just a little bit stronger. And for some of us, well, what's agape? Well, exactly. Agape stands for the most important word for love. It's about sacrificial love. It's not phileo, which is brotherly love, city, Philadelphia, brother, city of brotherly love is where we get phileo. It's, it's not about erotic love. That one's dangerous at times. Yeah. It's about sacrificial, unconditional. It's the example of Jesus that he gave to you husbands when he says, husbands, love your wives. How? the way Christ loved the church. And what did Christ do? He sacrificed himself on a cross out of love for his wife. And that's the unconditional agape love that that Jesus is saying we're supposed to have. Loving God. Do you know that love has its origin in God? And here's what's really cool is you're never closer to God than when you love somebody else. Did you catch that? When we love somebody else, that's when we connect with God. It's only by loving someone else that we get to know God better. It's by loving God that we respond and get to know him better. Because God's love is there for us. Incidentally, God's love holds nothing back. Are you aware of that? It's a no holds barred kind of love. He says, you know, nothing's going to stop him. So he will go from heaven to hell, literally, in order to demonstrate and to give his love to us. Nothing stops him. And nothing, what did Romans 8 say, can separate us from that incredible love that God wants to give us through Jesus Christ. And by the way, God's love is totally undeserved. I know some of you think that you'll be good enough. And isn't this one of the big mistakes that, that, that people make? Well, you know, surely God's such a loving God. And when I get to the end of life, he'll love me enough that be, and, and he'll let me in. Really? Because you've been so good? Folks, you can't be good enough. 
There is no way to earn and, and, and get God's love you, because you don't deserve it. And there's not going to be a single person who's going to walk up to the great gates of heaven and say, let me in because I deserve it. Oh, and God will say, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were one of those. You know? No, because you see, when you get to the gates and you say, I deserve it, he's going to say, no. I'm sorry, I was going to say something stronger. No, because you can't earn your way in here. In fact, if you ever did anything wrong, you missed the boat. Unless you've got my son's name written on you and you've accepted Jesus' payment because you can't be good enough. It's undeserved love. That's why we call it grace, an amazing grace at that. The church father, Jerome, said that when the apostle Paul John was in his extreme old age, he was so weak that he had to be carried into church meetings. And he was in exile, you might remember. He's an old, old guy, right? And he, he was the last disciple. He was the one disciple that wasn't sacrificed in one way or another, although he was exiled and had a lot of pain because of it. And it says that the people, he would, they would preach sermons and they'd ask, okay, John, beloved, what message do you have? And John would weakly stand up and he would always reply, <clears throat> little children, let us love one another. <laughs> the disciples around him, followers of Jesus, began to grow weary with the same words every time. They finally asked him why he always said the same thing over and over. He replied, because it is the Lord's commandment. And if this only is done, it is enough. Little children, love one another. Did you know that when you love God right, you love people right? It goes together. You can't miss it. If you're really going to love God right, you're going to love people right too. Romans 13 says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to what? To love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. That's Romans 13, 8 through 10. Folks, our love, the love that we share, is a response to God. Ray Stedman put it this way. Love is not just a word to write on a plaque and put on your wall. Love is what you do <laughs> to people that irritate you. Has anyone here ever been irritated by Bill? Notice the people raising their hands. <laughs> Thanks, Les. <laughs> I want you to notice Debbie didn't raise hers because she's just too gracious. <laughs> and the boys don't want to draw attention, so they're not going to. <laughs> Love. <laughs> Love, Ray Stedman says, is what you do to people that irritate you. When you are upset and angry and hostile and feel like striking back. Well, no, some of you would be more gracious than that. You just look back with a dirty look or make the nasty, you know, snide comment, right? When you feel like striking back, that's when you start with God. Stedman goes and he says, remember his love to you. Remember his forgiving spirit, how he wipes out everything without requiring anything from you. Respond to that love, Stedman says, and immediately pass it on to the one you are involved with. Love toward God is the most important thing in our life. Jesus is right when he says, loving God is top priority. Everyone else, everything else will flow from that love. But if you put anything else first, the whole process will soon run dry. Do you love one another? 
You see, if you don't love one another, that's evidence you don't know God. Do you love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength? See, it's not just about how well you worship then, is it? It's not just about how much time you spend in his word, what kinds of things that you do even for the community. This is about your relationship with him. Do you love him with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength? Because if you do, then that's gonna come out in your relationships with one another. Well, let's look closer again at John, 1 John. First, in 1 John 4, 7 to 8, God is the source of all love. What, what, what John is saying to here is, is that, that love is the essence of God himself. If you're going to call yourself a Christian, if you're going to say you are God's and you belong to God and you truly are his, then conduct yourself as he would with love. 1 John 3.18 says it this way, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and the truth. Second thing we learn from 1 John 4, verses 9 and 10, is that God models what genuine love is. He's already shown us. This is what love is, and what does he say? He, he models it by, it, it's, it's a sacrifice. It's about coming and leaving everything that he has, everything that's special, everything that's important, everything that, that makes him God, and leaving it all behind, emptying himself, as Philippians says, and becoming a man. God models genuine love. MacArthur says we put God on display by loving each other. Did you catch that one? There's no human explanation for the level of this affection and love. Love is our testimony. The unseen God is seen in our love for each other. That's why that old song says, they'll know we are Christians by our what? Love. No, the signs on the church buildings, the, you know, the cars we drive, the band, the stickers on the back of the bumpers. That's how, we, you know, not, not of this world. All those, that's other. No, no, no. He says, it's going to be through our love for one another. And God, God is desperately wanting to love our community through us. God commands us to love each other in, in verses 11 and 12. In fact, Jesus said it this way, a new, verse John 13, 34, and 35, a new command I give to you. Oh, wasn't it an invitation? Can't we choose whether we're going to do this one or not? Well, actually, yeah, you can. You can choose whether you're going to obey God or not. But it's kind of dangerous to not obey God because you're good. First off, I'm going to tell you, if you don't obey God, you're going to miss out on some really good times. And you're going to feel some guilt. Now, if you wash the guilt away and don't care anymore about whether you're doing what God wants or not, then you're going to be messed up. And that's what sin does to us. Jesus said this, a new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Incidentally, he, in another passage, right just around that same conversation, he says, greater love has no man than this than he laid down his life for his friends. Yeah, husbands and wives, you know something about that, don't you? Have you ever stopped the argument and simply apologized even though maybe she was wrong? Or he was wrong. You see, <laughs> love is laying down your life for another person. Well, God, God's love is the thing that assures us that we have salvation. Do you see that in verses 13 to 15? We know that we live in him and he in us. How do we know it? Well, because he's given us his spirit. Oh, okay, good. How do we know we have his spirit? Oh, well, here's what he says. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, what? God lives in him and he in God. There's the evidence. You've got the Holy Spirit living in you. If you've acknowledged that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, has come, died, risen from the dead for you, you've got him living in you, which means, guess what? You've got the Holy Spirit already there. Doesn't mean you're necessarily letting the Holy Spirit accomplish things or fill you with his power, but the Holy Spirit's there regardless. God is love. And his love gives us confidence. Really? 
Yeah, because what he say? Perfect love drives out all fear. We don't need to be afraid of being judged. You don't have to fear going to heaven or whether there is a heaven or not because God has already said it's there and I'm already going to give it to you if you believe in me. So God's love gives us confidence that we can stand at the throne and not be afraid. We are commanded to love because love is our confidence in judgment. 1 John 3, 21 says, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, then we have confidence before God. The last thing I saw in the text here was that God loves us and so we love. John says with almost crude bluntness, I'm quoting um, a theologian here, I I think it was MacArthur, that a man who claims to love God and hates his brother is nothing other than a liar. The only way to prove that we love God is to love the men whom God loves and women. The only way to prove that God is within our hearts is constantly to show the love of people within our lives. I have a question. How do you know when you're loved? Why don't you think about that for a few moments? How do you know when you are loved? It's because... Somebody sends you these cards and says, I love you, you're wonderful, you're so special, right? Yes. Or you get C's candy at Christmas. Or, or, how, how do you know when you're loved? And I have to confess that there is a challenge, isn't it, when it says, love one another as you love yourself. How many of you would say, I love myself? Now you don't have to raise your hands. I'm going to ask you to do that. Be careful. <laughs> but it's okay. But how many, how many of you would say, I love myself? Now, I'm not asking you, do you look in the mirror and say, whoa, I love you, like a narcissist? That's really a bit job, problem. But, but do you love what God has created? Or is that part of the problem why you're having a hard time loving other people? Because you haven't embraced what God's created in you. You don't love yourself. And it does that. It can hinder us from loving others, can it? And frankly, that was the, one of the battles I had to work through. And it was ultimately because I sinned and almost lost my marriage. And my wife loved me unconditionally that I learned what unconditional love was in my heart, not just my head. Some of us are sitting in church here this morning and you got it in your head, but it hasn't made it to the heart. How do you know you're loved? Sometimes you know it at Christmas time, don't you? They actually heard that you wanted, (laughs) it was Jen Christmas time. You finally heard I didn't want something. She wanted to have some gifts given in her name to someone else. Well, what was she really saying was you love me because you listened to me. See, there's all kinds of ways. How do you know when you're loved? Some of those notes that I've gotten from the guys, from my boys, the men. It's a gift that we got this Christmas. So they listened. They listened to something that's special something that Bill wants to do. And they're planting the seeds and opening the door for us to hopefully go to Israel. They listened. But you know what? It was what they said that went with it. That said, wow, I'm loved. How do you know you are loved? Because here's the key. However you know you are loved is what you need to do to love others. Folks, stop waiting. Stop waiting for people to come to you. Stop waiting for people to love you. Love one another. And so fulfill the law of God in Christ Jesus.
Father, you know whether we're really loving or not. And Lord God, you know if we love you truly or not. Forgive us, Lord, when we get selfish or self-centered or just distracted and we don't love each other. Forgive us, Lord, when our example of love is one that's less than to be desired by our community. Help us, Lord, to love the way you've loved us. Today, Jesus, as we begin a new year, We want to begin the, the, the year by loving you more than we've loved you before, by loving you with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, by loving you from the inside out, not just from our head. I want to pause my prayer just for a moment. Do you love God? And maybe I need to ask you, hey guys, right now, no movement, no play. Do you, have you accepted God's love for you? you? Say, well, I don't deserve it. I'm not worthy. You know, how do I really know? You know what? You don't deserve it. You're not worthy. Nothing you can do to earn it. All you can do is accept it. If you've never accepted his love in your heart, not just your head, Christian, I invite you to accept the love of Jesus Christ today. Father, plant that love within us. And Lord, give us evidence that we know we're loved because we love one another. In Jesus' name.